Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Later in the show, we're all talking about Northampton right now as there's been movement with some of its major marquees. We'll chat with NEPM's Jill Kaufman about what's going on with the Calvin Theater and Pearl Street and other Eric Shore venues. And Holyoke is home to not only one of the most frequent farmer's markets, but one of the longer operating seasons as well. And this year, it got a new manager. We'll chat with the new leadership and one of the farms that often makes an appearance there, La Arisibeña Torres Family Farm. I swear I actually know Spanish and can say this word, and yet somehow I keep looking at their name and going, what? How do those letters work? You did great. Thanks. But first, it's been a while since we met a new mayor. Let's remedy that by heading to the Berkshires. We're on the campus of Mass Mocha in North Adams with the mayor of North Adams, who's currently running for re-election, Mayor Jennifer Maxey. We've brought our director, Tony Dunn, who happens to be a North Adams resident, to make sure we're fact-checked. And if any uh, citizenry questions come up in the course of this conversation from him as a voter in North Adams, jump right in, Tony. How many races are there? Contested right now in Western Massachusetts, seven. Seven, okay. We'll get to them all, I think. Maybe. We're gonna try. We're gonna try. Yeah. We'll do our best. And what's interesting here in North Adams is our term is only two years, whereas in Pittsfield it's four, and in most communities it's four. Yeah, and some of the people who are, like in East Hampton, who have our mayor now, started out with terms that were shorter, but then the charter changes. Does it feel like you're constantly running, having to run for mayor when you have a two-year term? Yes and no. I think if, for me, I just do my job every day and I try to serve the people and I treat the campaign as a large search committee. If you, I feel if you do your job every day and you're responsive to your citizens, then you're campaigning and you're doing what your, your public service is set out to do. Is it the same term length as the councilors? Yes. In North Adams, we're all two years terms. Mm -hmm. And so this is your first term. You were elected in 2001, became mayor in 2002. You do have an op opponent. Uh, uh, April. 2021? I see. It, I just erased 20 years off of everything. You were so elected. In the middle of the pandemic. You were elected in 2021. <laughs> it mayor. It's hard to remember those years. Oh, definitely. Mayor since 2022. Uh, your opponent is uh, April Carsno. Is that how you say Yes, name? April yeah. Carsno. And we are reaching out to her to have her on. You're the first female mayor of North Adams in its entire history. Yeah. And now you are in office at the same time where Massachusetts has its first elected female governor and lieutenant governor. Does that weight of history impact your work? A little bit. I want to be a role model for younger girls. Um, I work very hard in what I do and I want to set the example that if you work hard you get to be where you want to be and I think it's important that young women and, and especially young girls have role models. So there is some weight about that but I do my job just like my male counterparts. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're a little harder. <laughs> you hear that, Tom Bernard? We're gonna edit that part, right? <laughs> no, he's not. No, he's. A, I know him. He's fine. Um, let's get into some of the nitty gritty about the infrastructure of North Adams. I remember learning about the culverts here in North Adams during Hurricane <laughs> Irene. About how, if it were not for the culverts, essentially North Adams could have been washed away in a storm like that. So in Irene, mm. our savior was our flood control chutes. Uh huh. Um, so that is a project that has been near and dear to my heart since I began with the city in 1991. Without the flood control chutes, we obviously would have been flooded. Mm -hmm. um, what is, what's the difference? So the culverts actually kind of like run through Mass Mocha's campus. Exactly. The culvert runs underground uh -huh. and takes the water. The flood control chutes are those metal chutes that you see that hold all the water in. Mm. Um, so all the culverts in the city run into the flood control chute. Um, so they ca they're like a channel that carries the water into the flood control chute. Um, so one thing when we got into when I got into office, we were very very excited to partner with the Hoosick River Revitalization and really pound the pavement with the federal government to get funding for the feasibility study. A lot of our flood control chutes have falling walls, tipping walls, or the rebar is coming out of the cement. Um, so I'm proud to say that you know we were successful. We got funding from the state and the federal government with a million dollars from airmarked from the city um, through a borrowing order and that we kicked off that project on August 25th. So we are doing a real study of our flood control system and hoped to fix that before we all retire. <laughs> but I do want to talk to you about culverts. So on July 10th, we did have some major culvert failures. Most of that water was coming off the mountain. So we did have significant flooding within North Adams on July 10th. Um, and that's where the culverts come into play because so much water was going through a lot of them blew 
blew out underground, mm. um, causing us to look like the Beverly Hillbillies in some areas with water just blowing right. up the pavement. Black gold. Texas tea. You're just saying that like some of the infrastructure is a little bit outdated, yes. perhaps? So a lot of um, our infrastructure throughout, including water and sewer systems, not just specific culverts, are, are very outdated. Um, we are doing an extensive infrastructure study through our capital improvement plan as to how we can address those needs. When I came into office, I anticipated that there were more um, assessments done and more projects, what we call built, um, and they weren't. So I've been a little delayed on my infrastructure pledge but we're chipping away at it every day. But those high impact areas have caught the attention of the governor and Congressman Neal, and we're really pushing hard to get some funding. We had close to $5 million worth of damage for just from the July 10th storm, but it goes back to your culvert question. We need to repair that whole culvert line. Um, so it's quite extensive, but um, fun work, mm. fun work. The uh, NEPM News Department's Nancy Cohen has been looking into the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness, MVP yeah. grants. Is that the grant you're referring to from the state that, so you applied and got a million dollars for the state? Yeah. No, from that? no, the million do um, the million dollars was an airmark uh, thanks to Representative Barrett and Senator Mark. Mm. So that was the million dollars for the Hoosick River Revitalization Plan. Then the federal government has pledged a million, and the city of North Adams put up a borrowing order for a million dollars. So that's how we're going to pay for the feasibility stu study for the HRR. We are constantly applying for infrastructure uh, grant funding for different projects throughout the city. Um, but we are pushing pretty hard on the governor's office and talking to Congressman Neal about how they're gonna help us on July 10th. Um, right now, we didn't make the federal disaster declaration, um, but we're still looking for the state for some help. So did you get any money from that MVP grant or did you apply for that yeah. particular grant? Uh, we got some hazardous mitigation money for our dam repairs. Uh -huh. In North Adams with the current mayor who's running for re-election, Mayor Maxey, the gem of the Mohawk Theater is always in the news. What's going to happen with the theater? Who's restoring the theater? There's money for a marquee restoration. What's the future of that theater hold? How does that project stand right now? Okay. And what does your office in the city, how involved is, are you in that project? So my office, along with uh, community development in One Berkshire, is uh, we wrote a grant and we received a grant for close to $200,000 to restore the marquee. So I have matched those funding dollar for dollar, $400,000 project to restore the marquee. So currently the marquee is being built in a warehouse and it's gonna be restored to the original marquee. We're hoping to have it up a little bit after Columbus Day and we'll have a ribbon cutting. So my feeling is once we restore the marquee, it will make the downtown beautiful. And then from there, we're gonna put out another RFP for the Mohawk Theater to see um, if we can partner with someone or someone can take it over to make it a multi-purpose performing arts type center um, with also some conference planning and who knows maybe even some um, apartments or condos up top. Would the city retain ownership of, of the venue? Um, right now we're looking to sell the building however if I can put together the right type of programming and develop the right kind of team I'd like to keep a pulse on the Mohawk Theater because it's so important to our history um, but we're not in the performing arts world where that's not our book of business our book of business is public service um, but that doesn't mean that that's out of the question completely um, so our focus is getting the marquee up getting it lit up and then work on an RFP for the winter and hopefully have somebody in there you know next summer just doing some kind of construction but it's definitely an important part of my administration and I just don't want to give it away. Has Mass Mocha been in any conversations oh, yeah. with the, ma the mayor's office yeah. in response to what could happen in that theater? Yeah. Does it pose too much competition for an, an independent Listen. person coming from outside to try to run a theater in the shadow of Mass Mocha? Christy Edmonds, who's the new executive director at Mass Mocha, is fantastic and she has a, been a great partner to me. Um, it's not about competition, it's about having all of the pockets, all of the streets of the city of North Adams succeed, and that's our philosophy when we work together. She's been very helpful, very great with a lot of suggestions, and as well as other business owners in the community. So I try to have an inclusive process, roll it all up, and then get the request for proposal out. So, you know, working with MOCA is definitely an option. Um, working with MCLA is an option. Working with a private developer is an option. Um, my eyes are wide open, but it has to be in the best interest of that building and the community. One question in light of MCLA and the relationship with the city was there was a request perhaps to house refugees on the campus of MCLA and your office pushed back on that. Talk about that decision and why that was something you didn't want to pursue. Yeah. So first of all, let's get 
Let's just get the facts straight. I wasn't against a homeless shelter. I was against the fact of bringing people from outside the community to North Adams when we have our own people struggling here in North Adams and our surrounding communities. I wouldn't have a problem with having a homeless shelter developed to help our own needs first. And once those needs were addressed, I wouldn't have a problem opening it up. However, I didn't want to bring other people's problems into our community when we couldn't, when we're having a hard time managing our own problems with homelessness, food insecurity, social emotional health, etc. Um, and I also feel there's not enough resources in North Adams to handle the magnitude of. Um, things that needed to be handled. So I'm not against the homeless people, but I want to take care of my homeless people here in North Adams first. Is there a movement to open a homeless shelter for North Adams residents first at MCLA or elsewhere? I can't speak to MCLA direct, um, but where we work very closely with the Lewiston House and the churches, and um, we're actually having conversations with some developers um, to talk about the potential of maybe expanding more resources for our community. We're treating a homeless problem separate from a refugee problem, correct? Yes, yes. Um, originally when the plan was pitched to us, it was refugees, and then it was, you know, people from West Springfield, people from the Boston area. Then it was, okay, North Adams, you're going to have a couple of beds. And I just want it committed to Berkshire County. I want it to commit it to our North Adams residents. You know, Governor Healy and I have had a wonderful relationship. We work very well together, um, but that's something we disagreed on. Um, and our hopes are that, you know, they'll help us build something for our own people here. The governor has declared a refugee crisis in the Commonwealth. It's a refugee crisis across the entire country. What should a city like North Adams or other cities in the surrounding communities' response be to help ameliorate that crisis rather than to say, not in our city? Well, I'm not saying not in our city. I'm saying let's develop some systems for our people first and we can build upon those. Is it directly the responsibility of cities alone to do it? To Would there have been funding yeah. from the state to, to develop that at MCLA? The homeless shelter that they were posing, yes, was going to be state developed, but the concerns that we had were resources, and the concerns that we had were impacts on that neighborhood. Um, we've had some tough things go on in that neighborhood, and just the rollout of the whole program was not well received, um, and I think a lot of that went around communication between the state, MCLA, and as well as my office. Um, but the, it goes back to, I want to take care of my own people first. I want to help all people, but I may have a responsibility to the people in this community first. Mayor Maxi, Mayor Maxi of North Adams. Later in the show, the lowdown on the upcoming changes to the music scene in Northampton, plus a visit with the Holyoke Farmers Market. And up next, more with Mayor Jennifer Maxi of North Adams about some tough decisions she had to make about the police chief and the fire chief in that city. You're listening to the fabulous 413 on 885 NEPM. Speaking with Mayor Jennifer Maxey, the mayor of North Adams, born and raised in North Adams, lifelong resident, and worked in city government here for decades now. First term as mayor, running for re-election in November. You had to make some tough decisions uh, in regards to public safety in your term as mayor. The police chief um, was let go, the fire chief were let go, uh, yeah, the fire chief, fire chief was, was on leave. Go. Anything you would have done differently in handling those situations? No, sir. Any more comment you want to make on this? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Then. I will be happy to talk to you about our public safety complex and, uh -huh. our, and, our, and our plans. So early on in my term, we moved the police department over to a temporary location on Holden Street. That was mostly done to increase um, employee morale, uh, make it a safe environment for our, our customers, as I call them. Um, we, we meet people at their most vulnerable and probably their worst times in their life, and they should be respected and, and treated with dignity. Um, so we have a beautiful facility someday. I'd love to take you on a tour of that. So that's one of the proud accomplishments that I have. You know, on the fire department side, that team is doing a lot of work with fire safety, um, with our, our, our elderly population and in our schools. I'm very pleased to say that we've hired close to seven or eight police officers, eight firemen. So we're building up our ranks to have a safer work environment to serve our community. But it's not about sitting in the police house and it's not about sitting in the fire station. Um, my team is really going out into the community and, and doing a lot of community awareness. And that's the story I want to tell about public safety. So you've been working in the city 
for decades, sorry, um, but... I'm only 27. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> started when you were seven years old. Yeah. Like, talk about how you got started in local government and why it was important for you to get sure. started in local government. So it was in uh, around 1991. I needed a summer job and my mother said, you're not going to sit home on the couch. And um, my first job was at the landfill. It really was a landfill at the time. And I sold composting bins and stickers and I came home absolutely filthy and cried every single night. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I knew I was a politician. Right? <laughs> and uh, my mother basically said, you know, I don't know if you can say this on the news, but suck it up, buttercup, because this is going to pay off someday. And I finished that summer, went to school, and the next summer I got a job at City Hall. I got inside. I got into public services where I worked for the administrative officer and I worked in the cemetery department. I was responsible for keeping track of um, all of the uh, plots and funerals and also got exposed to like water billing and collections. And I stayed, just stayed every summer, every break. Mayor Barrett at the time, Rep Barrett now, uh, kept me around. And then when I graduated from college, he said, I got a job for you, you're already trained. And I became the director of finance and purchasing in 95. And then from there, I did a lot of special projects for Mayor Barrett and had an opportunity to become the treasurer and collector in 2000. And that was the job that I loved the most. So I stayed for another um, eight years and decided, you know, what am I gonna do with my life? You know, John was gonna retire soon, and what was I, where, where did I fit? Um, and I decided I wanted to teach. So I sent my resume over to MCLA, and they called me and they're like, we don't have a teaching job for you, but we have a director of student accounts position, and it would be great for you to get in and start engaging with students. So I jumped ship, went to MCLA for another eight years, loved every minute of it. Then I went to Southern Vermont College for about four before they closed. Um, again, loving education, but always wanting to go back to City Hall. And then I spent three years as the assistant superintendent for the North Berkshire School Union. And then COVID hit, and I said, you know, I gotta run for mayor. I gotta get back there. And I talked to my family, and they were like, you're nuts. You, got a good, you have a good paying job, you sleep at night. No. And we were driving around one day, and my mom said, you know, I'm gonna be 90, and I'd like to see my daughter be mayor. And wow. I said, that's it, Mar Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Call everybody together, we're having a meeting. And we went to my sisters in Cheshire, and we all talked about it as a family. And my boyfriend said, if this is what you want to do, let's do it. And that's all she wrote, it was a 4th of July picnic. The family decided I was going to run for mayor, and July 5th, I think it was, 6th, I pulled my papers, and here we are today. And you liked it so much, you're running again. Yes. Two-year term. The election is in November. What are the best parts and worst parts about being mayor? You've seen it from the inside, through other mayors' eyes. What, now that you're in that seat? I can honestly say you have to take everything in stride. I'm glad that I had experience working with actually with all the mayors over, over the years in different capacities. The hardest thing and the worst thing is you can't fix everything all at once. We are slower than death. Our processes are slow. Our funding is slow and narrow, um, not enough to go around. But the work and the engagement with the people and the progress, even though it is slow, some things move real fast, other things are slow. The progress and the commitment to the community that a lot of people have is what keeps me going every day. The things I hate, I would wish I could spend more time at home with my mom and my boyfriend and my dog. But this, they told you to take this job. Right, but they wanted me to take this job. Yeah. Um, so the work to life balance is sometimes very difficult. And I have a very hands-on approach. If my team is out, I am out, um, which proves for some interesting pictures during storms. Um, <laughs> but the hard things are really just because our process is so slow. You know, you really want to help those homeless people. You really want to help that school-age kid that's having a little problem. But there's a process around everything. But there's more good in this work than there are down days. But I try to do the best for the city every single moment that I'm awake. And then sometimes even when I'm sleeping, mm -hmm. my mind is churning. <laughs> But there really aren't a lot of bad things. There are some hard decisions to make. There are a lot of hard decisions that affect people. Um, but we have to look at the overall community and the future of the community. We can't live in the past, which is hard for some people to understand. We can't stay stuck in today, but we have to make decisions based on the future of North Adams. And that's what I try to do every single day. What sort of impacts do 
both student influx and the various festivals that happen at Mass Mocha, the various events, have on North Adams, like infrastructure wise? Infrastructure wise, infrastructure, you know, water, sewer, that kind of stuff. Our systems can handle these kind of events. The toll that we take mostly is on parking and traffic, um, which I hope, I know over the last two years, we've gotten a lot better um, in managing traffic and parking. Um, we try to notify the residents of our big events. But for us, events like this are fantastic. They take a toll on our staff because we're all here all weekend, which is okay, and there's not a lot of us. But we encourage events like this. We want to showcase our city. We want to welcome people in hopes that they'll re keep returning, or maybe someday they'll move here. Tony, you want to move here? Tony already lives here. I know, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I do, yeah. I do. We didn't and grow up here. So. I did not grow up here. I grew up in the eastern part of the state, and uh, it's lovely. You have mountains, and you have culture and art. The best of all worlds, I think. Anything you want to grill the mayor about as a North Adams resident? Uh, not grill. Potholes. Uh, you hit the nail on the yeah, head. I have yeah. one on my street. Infrastructure would be my would be my one question. You know, the fire hydrants and and the roads. And I do see. You know, I have a commute. I commute to Springfield every day, almost every day. And I see other communities are are ramping up their paving. Understanding that you know this has been a long term problem for the city. Yeah. What what's the future of, of the infrastructure here? So potholes. That's an easy fix. I'll put you on the list. We'll get that fixed for you. Nice. That, that check. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a couple of big projects specifically in your area on the stormwater uh, system, which is taking a little bit longer. But as far as streets and sidewalks go, we put out to bid twice a project as long, uh, along with a, a demo project to do streets, sidewalks, um, do, really focus on some handicap ramp repairs. The bids came in close to three, four hundred thousand dollars over budget. So we had to pull back on, on some of our paving this year. Um, so we're doing more patching than paving, um, but we're gonna go out late in the fall to tee up and get on everyone's schedule. But really what happened here in North Adams was with our all of this, all of our internal work got pushed so far back because of these storms. And you know, I only have a crew of like 12 to 15 guys at the highway department, and that includes water and parks and rec. Um, and they really are working as the best that they can. But the State Street job, I mean, I had to beg somebody to come and give me a price. Like, people are busy. And it's been difficult, but we're trying to keep up with those kind of things. It's a jungle, and I just wish the rain would stop. Yeah. And then your question does. about fire hydrants. So under the Bernard administration, they did a great job of fixing close to 300 fire hydrants. We just met a few weeks ago, and we, I think we have four that are out of service that will be repaired by the end of October. Um, so I commend um, Mayor Bernard for taking that leap and getting that done. Um, but the thing with the fire hydrants is maintenance. So we've developed a maintenance plan. We meet regularly. We just met the highway department and the fire union to talk about what our plans are, where we're flushing. Um, and that's all part of our maintenance schedule. There was a time when they just weren't being flushed. There was a time when they just weren't being maintained. Um, we have an excellent water department foreman who's very committed to making sure that when the fire department rolls and they have to use those hydrants, they work. To the point that every time there's a, 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 a full call, an all call, our water department rolls as well. Um, so we're building ops plans around things um, that to a resident seem that's what you do. Um, but you'd be surprised there, there weren't a lot of working together processes. Um, built out and that's something that I've been very focused on. Coming into office and noticing these things that weren't being done that you had assumed were being done, are there mayors whose tenure you're looking at that you enjoyed and are kind of examples to to hold up and conversely ones you're more disappointed by after being in office? I can honestly say all of us, all the mayors I've worked with, Mayor Barrett, Mayor Alcumbright, who was just here, Mayor Bernard, Tom and I work together at MCLA. We all have different philosophies. We have a lot of things in common, but we had different priorities. Nobody should judge. You don't know what it is until you sit in that seat on that given day, and I'm not one of those people. Um, I admire all of them, and I appreciate all of their services. There are times that I get the 
burning in my belly like a little bit of a John Barrett and then I have to calm down and shake hands and smile at people so um, I will be honest with you you know I worked for Mayor Barrett for 16 years I learned a lot of good things from him but I'm my own mayor and um, in my first campaign that was a hot topic you know she's going to be like John Barrett well you're right I am a little bit like him I care just as much as he did about this community but I'm also my own person you know there are many things that I compliment my predecessors for and the things that we don't agree on I just change them because you're the mayor it's the power of office (laughs) yeah right Right? Right. you know being a public servant is not an easy job we don't get paid much and we spend long hours but everyone loves the work that we do and I especially do and honestly at this point in my life and in my career I this I'm hoping this will be my last job before I retire I started my career here I want to end of my career here and that's always been my career plan and one last question sure. where's the good pizza in North Adams oh I can't answer that I'd be biased no we're looking for bias we have okay. a whole thing where we go out and try the pizza <laughs> yeah I would I would go to Christos I would go to village pizza up on the corner then stop down at the Emporium and get a really nice iced tea you can go in and ask for the mayor Maxi iced tea yeah. and then stop over and get some sweets at Bailey's there's a lot of great places happening here I'm going to hit Jack's Hot Dogs, too. Oh, and check out the barbecue guy. Yeah, He's I haven't checked that out yet. Yeah. Mayor Jennifer Maxey, Mayor of North Adams, running for re-election. Thanks so much for taking so much time with us. Thank you. I really appreciated your time. Thank you so much. We reached out to Mayor Maxey's challenger, April Lynn Carcino. She less than politely declined to chat with us. But the offer is still open. <laughs> North Adams and Mass Mocha, where we had our chat, is the home of Wilco's Solid Sound Festival, and one of the major players who produces that festival is making inroads to the Northampton music scene. We'll get into what's happening with two well-known music venues. Changes are afoot. But next, we'll head to Holyoke to hear how the new manager of their farmer's market is feeling about his first year at the helm. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by the UMass Five College Credit Union, offering co-op advantage checking with cash back on all purchases, plus secure debit card controls, all from the UMass Five mobile banking app. Insured by NCUA, umass5.coop. Time for another Local Hero Spotlight with Phil Corman from CESA, the Local Hero folks, and a bunch of people from the Holyoke Farmer's Market. Alexis Diaz de Jesus, the market manager of the Holyoke Farmer's Market, and Benito and Damares Torres from La Arecibeña Torres Family Farm, making farm products through Nuestras Raices, right near the river in Holyoke. Now, let's start with you, Alexis, who is the market manager. Your story to becoming the market manager over the course of not even yet a year is an interesting one. How did you get involved in the Holyoke Farmer's Market? Basically, I was working for Lighthouse Holyoke as an AmeriCorps member when somebody reached out to me, the director of Lighthouse, asking me if if I wanted the opportunity to apply to become the Holyoke Farmer's Market Manager. Let me stop you right there. Lighthouse is sort of like a, uh, an alternative to school program a la North Star Self-Directed Learning for Teens in Sunderland actually grew out of it. And AmeriCorps people are familiar with, which is the uh, Peace Corps for different sorts of projects here stateside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm one of the first graduates from that school. So I'm I'm an alumni and I was able to work there last year and it it was amazing. And basically Catherine told me about this opportunity and they reached out and, um, I was really wondering, like, do, what does this mean? I never really went to a farmer's market other than, like, actually going to the Holyoke Farmer's Market when I was a kid. After learning about it, I was like, where are farmer's markets now? And I kind of started visiting farmer's markets around the cities and, and around the local towns. And I was like, this is actually, like, amazing, and I would love to, like, be a part of this. And I applied, and I got the interview, and then I got the job. And I work out of the Holyoke um, Chamber of Commerce, and I have like a little office in there. And um, I never really had a job like that. If I show you my resume, it was basically like warehouse jobs and um, sales associate jobs. And uh, pretty much having this opportunity, I've grown a lot and um, learned so much, connected with so many great people like Benito and his family. And what they do is amazing. And I like appreciate anything that they bring to the table because it's like, it's so like fresh and 
if you guys see like their table at the farmer's market, you guys would be amazed. So I'm kind of curious because I think the job is uh, of being a manager of a farmer's market is one that people don't really understand. They just come, they go to the market, they expect everything to be there, but it's actually pretty complicated and a lot of moving parts. What have you found to be the most challenging and maybe the most interesting in your first year of doing it? Going into it, I, I didn't know about like how to contact vendors. So as I was learning that, I knew that people charged vendors to like be a part of it. So I didn't want to do that to like the farmers and to the vendors because they're like small like businesses that are starting and they're local and they're all like struggling to get out. So like me char feel like charging them wouldn't be right. So I don't charge any of my vendors or any of the farmers to be a part of the market as a way to like get people in. So the interesting and challenging part about that is that it comes with like flexibility. So they come and go when they want. So sometimes I have a lot of farmers and then no vendors, <laughs> no craft vendors and stuff like that, which is totally fine with me because it's a farmer's market, not a craft fair. How do you make it farm. financially sustainable if you're not charging the farmers or the vendors? Right now, I'm, I'm looking into that. <laughs> 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 but there is, it's ton, there's a ton of growth and a ton of opportunities, and there's a ton of uh, people that are interested in making it grow. So I know that that's going to come. We're speaking with Alexis Diaz de Jesus, the market manager of the Holyoke Farmers Market. Is the summer market separate from the winter market? Uh, no, it's still the Holyoke Farmers Market. Me so Jesus, so is this going to be your first winter doing the winter market? No, actually, I started in the winter. You started in the winter because the winter one is the one that I used to volunteer at. Awesome. <laughs> the Holyoke Farmers Market in general is just kind of a little bit slept on, which is a shame because they get such cool stuff. And a lot of folks that won't come further, um, especially like further north than Hamden County, like end up in Holyoke and are selling really, really neat things. So congratulations and we're rooting for you. <laughs> yeah, this winter is should be really great. Um, I'm gonna have Benito there and he's gonna have some products. I know I'm gonna have DNR Farms. They're gonna have a, a bunch of products because they have a greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And um, then we're gonna have vendors like Tempest Temptations, uh, the uh, Mama D's, she makes like empanadas and fried stuff like that. Well, Alexis, the market manager of the Holyoke Farmers Market, mentioned Benito Torres from La Arecibeña Torres Family Farm and Damares Torres is with him as well. Benito was one of the speakers at Field Notes, the CISA-sponsored and now NEPM-supported storytelling event. And what was amazing about your story, Benito, was all in Espanol with subtitles so that people who don't speak Spanish could follow along. But tell us about your farm. My farm is, is something special for me. Uh, it's something they help me out a lot. But the thing it is, be a farmer is not easy. But what I started with Nutra Raices, I just started to see I can do something, recognize that I'm born in Puerto Rico. And um, my grandma, my aunt, and a couple of people in the family was planting a lot of vegetables, teach me to how to plant vegetables. But I get this country here. It was hard because it's not the same tropical and mm -hmm. you know, United States. So mm -hmm. um, we had to wait till the summer. So I just looking for another raices. Somebody give me direction. I find out the place. I start doing paperwork and everything, so I just rented the lamb, and it was kind of you know frustrated, but I made it, <laughs> and I like it. I like it to be in there. I started with one eighth lamb, and now I got three quarter. Three quarters of an, an acre. acre. An nice. Acre. And mostly I run by myself, you know, but my teenagers is getting, you know, in the size what it's supposed to do. <laughs> my wife helped me too, but she's working in the best American center. She cannot be all the time with me. And it's hard what you have to make 275 holes to put a corn with the fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And then you have to cover it again. And then you have to throw the pipe and the dripping hoses. Mm -hmm. Mean a lot of sweat, a lot of in a string going out on you. And I was pushing myself up, but when I get home, um, I just wanted to take a shower, eat, and go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people, I say, it's not going to make it this year. It's not going to make it. But I always feel bad inside of me, but I just push myself up. And all the time, I feel like a human being, like I'm going down. But the same way, it's like I not touch the ground. Something lifted me up again and helped me out to keep going. And I'm um, being three years of former. I like to be in there. I like to bring the nice, good quality product to the people. I mean, especially when it's organic. I'm glad that um, uh, Alexis is working with us and being there all the time. What I need, everything is come over here. We talk and he helped me with a lot of people too, you know. I'm trying to find out now a kitchen to do my bake good and those things that I know how to do. I'm online, co-certified too. So um, 
I like to cook and be a farmer. I got a huge idea in my mind is to have a farm, to the farm to the table, to the table in the kitchen, and now we're going to put in the table for the people. That's my goal. That's farmer Benito Torres from La Arecibeña Torres Family Farm, farming through Nuestras Raices near the river in Holyoke, right near where we were rowing, Calise, a couple weeks ago. And, oh, I was uh, about to ask, yeah, where the, where the parcel is. Yeah, so it's not is. the downtown area that some people have seen if they're in the middle of downtown Holyoke, but it's uh, sort of out in the outskirts of the city. But Alexis, who's the market manager for the Holyoke Farmer's Market, you were saying uh, Benito makes this hot sauce. You're trying to help figure out how to get this hot sauce more marketable. So not only are you managing the farmer's market on a bi-weekly opportunity for people to come by, you're helping the farmers take it to the next level for their for their marketing. Yeah, for sure. It's it's, it's very um, tied to like our culture and like entrepreneurship. And and thing about that is that like not a lot of people in our culture are educated about entrepreneurship or how to make your stuff marketable. So like I know Benito has a good product and I know Benito can like learn all these things and his family is, is going to be supportive about it. So I know once they once they learn it, they're gonna be able to make this hot sauce and then push that onto the, all the other products that they make at, at, in their kitchen. And you're a young man. Can yeah, I ask looks, how old you are? He looks like seven in I'm his seventies. Twenty-four. 70s. Twenty-four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I mean, it's like this is you're really. <laughs> this is a. It's amazing for me to hear your story and how proactive you've gotten. This you were also telling me that it was kind of army or farmy for you. Like this was a, a, a decision that you made. You were gonna join the military. Yeah, that was it was a close call for me for sure had the people coming knocking at my house talking to my parents and everything mm-hmm. that's um, disturbing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah, like, i know like they want to recruit people but like don't show up at my house well like, maybe maybe stress. benito we need to go door to door to encourage people to become farmers yeah i think that's a good compete. idea well i think it's so important that people see there's lots of options and if you don't see lots of options it's who knocks on your door yeah and the fact that um you know, you're able to show where you are to people who are younger. They can see themselves where otherwise there is no path to be seen. But I did want to just say, like, these rules for being able to sell your own food are very complicated. So it's mm-hmm. not just like, OK, in our culture, you know, this is a little bit different. It's like for anybody who's trying to start a business, mm-hmm. it's very complicated. And it's so great that you're seeing Benito every week. And so Benito has a question. And you know that there are, you know, the Franklin County CDC and CISA and other groups are really happy to be part of that path. Definitely. What other farmers from Holyoke are at your market? So we had a, a good cooperative. <laughs> they they were there for a couple of weeks in the summer. Uh, and we also have more farmers from Nuestras Raices that that they join us a couple of brothers and I just I wanted to to mention about like um that Benito speaks Spanish and and also English and I speak English and Spanish and Demar does yeah, too so like, like the bilingual aspect of my farmers market is like something that's probably not as common in other farmers markets yeah. in the surrounding areas so yeah. like it is, does feel gr- good and I know Benito does too when when a family that doesn't speak English comes to the market and we're able to actually like help them out and and actually like show them that they, they're welcomed here and we welcome and every ethnic background in, in the community to come out to the farmers market and have a great time with us and there are two markets a week all running all the way through October right yes yes so there's gonna be two more for the Wednesday markets and then uh, three Saturday markets and the winter market will start in in December in December so you, you get a month off at least yeah the plan of planning and, and logistic yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, is it still on Appleton so this this I haven't chose the location oh but, you see, and you have a month to choose the location yeah. too yeah when we make that decision, though. You guys will be the first ones to find it. Excellent. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Saturday market's on Heritage Street, and the Wednesday market is at the Holyoke Medical Center. I saw our farmer, Benito Torres, come in with something. I know. Was I it, literally. Is it hot sauce? I saw you pull something out, a jar out, and I was like, oh, I saw chilies and something. Like Beyonce. And I got real excited. He's got hot sauce in his bag. I got hot sauce in my bag. Like tortillas that you can oh. <laughs> try them on. I forgot a little bit thing to put in it, but I'm Oh, out. wait, hold on. I can fix that. It's the way you... Here we are off mic again. It's like when we made burgers last week. This is the second time people have brought food in and we haven't had the utensils. We just need to have them here in the studio and we'll answer any questions for people at 8 p.m. later. We've started a new program. Feed your local journalist. (laughs) 
I'm a certified cuck, and I want to know somebody is allergic to anything here. Yeah. Before we're, anything. We are not. These people teach me to work professional. A absolutely. Like, engage the customer, engage the people. Yeah. I got the say go. I got allergen. I got alcohol. I got the say sales manager and everything and handle the food. For me, it's very, very important to have those rules in here because it's a the safety for the people. It's great. You know I thank I mean? you for asking. Yeah. Luckily, we don't have to worry about that. At least, <laughs> Kalis yeah. and I don't. Yeah, because I do the the pineapple water, and some people is allergic to the pineapple. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. So we haven't talked at all about that the market does uh, take Snap and Hip. Yeah. So Snap is the EBT card that people um, get for the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, initiative in it that is to to help people like come learn about farmers markets or go to farm stands and farms and buy produce. And they give people up to $80 in this um, incentive. It reimburses you on your food stamps yes. or your SNAP to encourage you to buy farm fresh goods through a farmer's market, through certain farm stands, through certain farms. Yeah, and It's money, a great program. The money is put in there um, every time they put in, put in like the monthly money. All right. Kalisa's right. come with a cup so that we can put some of the oh, that's why you hot came. sauce. You to, <laughs> careful, you're you're the server. Yes. Right. So, like, without giving away too many secrets, yeah, what's no, in this? Um, it's the pineapple water, which we, we take the skin of the pineapple and we boil the skin and we extract the water from the pineapple. Um, it has um, Thai dragon chili, um, cayenne pepper, oregano, garlic, and peppercorn. That also has vinegar in it, so the vinegar is what keeps it from spoiling or anything like that. So that's what's in it. The garlic is inside with the pepper. So the water and the vinegar are trying to get it inside to get the pepper and the flavor. Yeah. And then the hot sauce is going to come up and everything is going down. So you have the flavor and the juice. Love it. All right. Well, now we got to try it. And is this a family recipe or you created it? That's a family in Puerto Rico. We, my, my grandma and my mom, she was doing it all the time, and I am keep an eye. Mostly thing that I know how to do it because uh, every time I was at home with my mom and my grandma around to my family, and I learned a lot of things from them too. Yeah. This yeah. smells so good. I can't wait to try it like on the sandwich. And oh, I got it all over my pants. <laughs> Spicy pants. Hot pants. Hot pants. Hey, hot pants. Oh, this is really good. It's really good. It's got a good heat yeah, and a and good it's flavor. Not, it's not overpowering. And it gives such a different flavor to our food. Like It, it, it gives it that extra. Mm, what do you, do you like know? to put this on? Everything I have. <laughs> <laughs> Cereal, <laughs> ice cream. Yes. <laughs> yeah, have fun with it. Have a ball. Acid always perks up your flavors. And then you've got, like again, like just enough heat, not too much. We're not looking for a challenge. We just want a little warmth. A little yeah, cake. and it's yeah. got that for sure. Well... This has been delicious and enlightening. Benito Torres from La Arecibeña Torres Family Farm and Damares Torres, who are farming through Nuestras Raices in Holyoke, and Alexis Diaz de Jesus, the market manager of the Holyoke Farmers Market, which will be going twice a week through the end of October, happening on Wednesdays at the Holyoke Medical Center and Saturdays on Heritage Street. I can't wait to see your hot sauce on store shelves in the coming years, Benito. It's delicious. And listen to the um, Valley Voices field notes through CISA and NEPM, where you can hear Benito's story in Espanol about coming stateside and farming here in Western Massachusetts. And Phil Corman from CISA, who are the local hero folks. You can learn about all of our local heroes at buylocalfood.org. So frito for everyone. Yes. A reminder that CISA is an underwriter of NEPM. And the Holyoke Farmers Market next convenes at Holyoke Medical Center tomorrow, Wednesday, October 4th, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's every other Wednesday, so next one is maybe your last chance. Up next, NEPM's own Jill Kaufman on the recent updates on the Calvin Theater and Pearl Street and all the actions of liquor licenses going on in downtown Northampton. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, homegrown in Hatfield, Massachusetts, and providing energy savings for their customers for over 10 years. Learn more at northeast-solar.com. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Khalees Smith. September 29th was the deadline for the IHEG Entertainment Group to have its shuttered venues back up and running or to have an alternate plan in place. And when this show ended yesterday, October 2nd, NEPM's Jill Kaufman was earlobes deep in a virtual alcoholic beverage licensing committee meeting over Zoom where some major news was being announced. 
I then, later that afternoon, saw my friend in real life posting on Facebook saying, did I just hear with my little ears on any PM that Sure is selling the Calvin? To find out what we're sure about and what we are not sure about is the aforementioned NEPM's Jill Kaufman. Homonyms. There have been <laughs> conflicting headlines about what is actually happening right now. Mass Lives headline. Eric Shore finds group to take over Calvin Theater, ask for more time to finalize sale. NEPM's very own headline uh, was Northampton officials extend liquor license deadline as Calvin Theater gets new buyer. And then the Gazette. A lifeline for the Calvin Theater. NYC operator of music venues to buy theater hopes to reopen early next year. This it seems to be circling around kind of the same thing, but what is? Can you untie this slightly Gordian knot? Me, yes. Well, I can tell you that I've never even read the closing on my house as deeply as I just read all the <laughs> notes from <laughs> from, from um, last night's uh, or yesterday afternoon's um, meeting of the licensing commission in Northampton. So the words that are being thrown around are: uh, so is there a buyer? of the building is what we're asking. There is definitely a buyer for the license. So Eric Shore is selling his license, this, uh, and they were delayed on this. They missed the deadline. Uh, Eric Shore missed the deadline. Uh, he is selling this license, or wants to, to the partnership of the Bowery Presents and others um, who plan to be the bookers for the Calvin. Big acts, these are, as you were describing, these are, or, or we talked early, these are really successful bookings. Wait, first describe um, the Bowery Presents and the other the other folks who are buying the license. And Higher Ground, who are the other uh, group that are are doing it. But uh, Bowery Presents has venues in Boston and Philadelphia, in New York, of course, because Bowery Ballroom is where it all started. And they are a large group that bring in very big names. They are booking the new Roadrunner in Boston. Yeah, I've seen the Sinclair been, in Boston. Yep. So these are top and tier. And the Royale, big, where I just was. Big, yeah. big acts. And then Higher Ground are the people that put on solid sound at Mass Mocha. Wilco's Festival, amongst other things. We saw representatives from Bowery Presents and Alex Crothers from Higher Ground. Yeah, I have reached out to Alex Crothers personally to ask, "Is are you buying the Calvin? Are you buying the license? And uh, they are haven't said anything yet. Mm-hmm. And I called and reached Eric Shore about an hour ago, and he said... Uh, A statement will come. He didn't say no. I said, who is, have you sold the building? Who is buying the building? A statement will come. So something's happening. Here's the, here's the language. Um, There uh, is an operator for this theater. Um, The licensing commissioners, the license commissioners use the word buyers. Um, They could have meant about the license. They could have meant about the building. Um, We used in our headline buyers. I I am not, now that I think about this, I'm not sure I wrote the right headline or not. Um, There is, there is something going to happen to that building. What's, um, what's exciting? Exciting, I think, and I watched this in uh, in your eyes <laughs> as you stood <laughs> over my shoulder, like, oh my goodness, that, like this is an amazingly, you know, successful large uh, booking agency. Who's going to come here? So between the sale of, of something at the Calvin um, and new new management and. Um, Pearl, uh, not Pearl Street, but the Iron Horse reopening under the parlor room. There's like this life coming up, uh, coming in, a new life, uh, renewed life to the city, since, not seen since the pandemic, I think. It's, it's a very exciting time. Even while simultaneously, it, it seems like Pearl Street has been entirely abandoned because they they canceled the liquor license for that venue. Yes. So that's the state. That is the one of- license that is canceled. He and, and Eric Shore did not sell it. He managed to sell the other licenses, uh, one license to the Iron Horse license to the Parlor Room, a uh, nonprofit, um, the Green Room license to another operator. Who will uh, operate still out of that still same, out of that still same out of space. Still out of that same space. Doing the same yep. thing. Which is a building that Eric owns, yes. Eric Shore. All right. Uh, the basement license is Went being to sold, to, which is a restaurant around the corner. Right. Um, so that's... <laughs> that's three. <laughs> that's three. No, Pearl Street canceled. Iron Horse Parlor Room. Uh, green Room to the Berkshire Farm Collective doing business as the Green Room. And the basement license goes to Gumbo. Yeah. So that's for the Calvin would go to this partnership of major bookers. And will the building be sold is the question. And we await confirmation on that. Um, I want to talk about who was on that, who was on the Zoom, though. Is that OK to, sure, to, to sure. talk about that now? I, I, I recognized who was on the D- Zoom. John Clancy is a partner at um, The Bowery Presents. John Moore, his partner, Alex Crothers. But who else was on that Zoom that you got really excited about? And it wasn't Chris Freeman who was also on the Zoom from the parlor room. <laughs> there was somebody else. Oh, it was John. John Sanders John Sand- of DSP, DSP shows. Show. Huh. So DSP shows is the other. I I I don't want to call it the 800 pound gorilla of booking, but it, maybe it is in town. And it seemed like it was going to be the only game in town for bringing top tier acts in. But now all of a sudden there are potentially other players bringing top tier acts to these huge venues in downtown Northampton, which up until a week and a half ago 
look like may be a ghost town when it comes to mm-hmm. live musical performance. Yes. The most fun I've ever had at a commission meeting, I gotta say. <laughs> and, and those That's commissioners, the most fun I've I know, ever had I know, a gotta, I know you're gonna shut me up in a second, but those commissioners were totally taken by surprise. Um, they, I mean, they knew paperwork was coming in, but they didn't know what, uh, what Eric Scher was about to say. And, um, Everyone we was surprised. Everyone yes. was surprised. Yes, for sure. Any PMs, Jill Kaufman. Thank you so much for Thank doing you. all the due diligence and helping us figure this out. And as soon as we hear more about it from either Eric Shore, who called you back. No, I called him and he picked up. Okay, there oh, you go. Just that's, to say. that's still more than. He did text me back the other day. And yeah. uh, anyhow, anyhow, as a reporter, it's, it's good to hear from your sources. Let me yeah. it there. <laughs> I, I've been doing radio <laughs> for 20 years in Western Mass, and he's only gone on my show once. So that's a big and, deal for you. I mean, I used to work for IHEG. Anyhow, <laughs> um, <laughs> Wednesday on the Fabulous 413, the magical sounds of Western Mass. We'll hear about the new season of Nero Orchestra from artistic director Kaylin Marcel Manson. And we'll expand our ears and get down to local and global music with the team behind Peace and Rhythm Records. Plus, word nerd Emily Brewster serves up some words from the world of food, from the fresh batch that just entered Merriam-Webster's dictionary. (laughs) Special thanks to Spouse, Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra, XTC, Tom Petty, Wilco, Suitcase Junket, Willie Colon, and Hector Laveau. David Byrne and Ben Folds 5. Our director is Tony. Got some multi for your tasking done. Our engineers are Betsy, Baby Chaos Lankto, Bart given up on the Red Sox rank, and Kara given up on Football Foster, Phil Pond to Bishop, and Punk Rude Boy Sharp Cheddar Dubay. I'm Monty Belmonte. I am Kalise Smith. We'll, we'll see, see you, you tomorrow, tomorrow on, on the Fabulous, fabulous 413. 413.